Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Mostly Sci-Fi 2, and this is Mostly Sci-Fi, and I'm your host. Please like and subscribe. You can donate to the Patreon. Uh, I told you here, there's a Patreon. It's on the front page, and it has five levels, and you can donate if you want. I would really appreciate that. And also, you can give thanks if you like one of my readings. You know, one uh, a couple of bucks would help me a long way. As I told you, I want to do this full time. Some people do ACX. <clears throat> I want to do um, reading alien novels on YouTube. It may sound like a dumb dream, but it is my dream. Okay, so please help it come true. Now, the story that is we're going to listen to and analyze is called dark mother. Okay. It's by David Farlin. It's from the anthology of bug hunt aliens, bug hunt and which was from Titan books. Okay. So we're going to get right into it. But first what we're going to do is we're going to read the synopsis of dark mother It's one of the 18 stories in aliens, bug hunt. So it's, Dark Mother is a 2017 short story written by David Farland, published by Titan Books as part of the anthology Aliens Bug Hunt. Set concurrently with Aliens, it reveals the final hours of Carter Burke at Haley's Hope, including his capture by the Xenomorphs and his imprisonment inside the hive at the colony's atmosphere processing plant, as well as shedding light on his unhappy upbringing. So this is one of my favorite out of the 18. You had about, I think I had about seven. Okay, seven or eight, which were pretty good. The rest were kind of eh. Okay, but I'm going to share with you those seven or eight that I thought was pretty good. I don't know if it's worth listening to one that's not so good, but uh, I think seven or eight is enough. And then after a while, we're going to go into... Um, Predator, if it bleeds, we're going to do that one. Uh, they have those short stories. And then I think they have another one called Ultimate Prey. So um, we're going to do a lot of these. It's not going to be only the Alien and Predator universe. They have other stuff like Chuck Palahniuk. I don't, I forgot his, uh, his last name, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, and he has some really interesting short stories. So we're going to be listening to those and I'm going to be doing like kind of like a deep analyzation. Okay. So without further ado, let's get into it. Dark Mother by David Farland. Sometimes we wake from dark dreams into a deeper darkness. Brew here. <laughs> Carter Burke pounded the lock mechanism on the door and felt a surge of relief as it bolted shut. Ripley, on the far side of the door, had had death in her eyes. <clears throat> Stupid sheep, he thought. She could have been rich. Yes, he'd tried to impregnate her and Newt with aliens, but he'd imagined that once they got to the bioweapons department at Wayland yutani the creatures could have been safely removed, sort of like a C-section. They would have been fine, and they'd all have gotten rich. Hmm. Instead, they were trapped beneath Hadley's hope, with xenomorphs filling the tunnels. Some people have no imagination. Stupid freaking cow. Now, to get out of this place. Burke whirled, fled through a storeroom, heard Ripley banging at the door, and glanced back. He drew a sliding panel shut between them and heard Chitin scrape the floor behind him. A hiss. Burke whirled to see a xenomorph warrior in the doorway, red warning lights reflecting off it. Terror spiked, sharp as a spear in the heart. He screamed, reached back to grab anything he might use as a weapon. The alien bared its double jaws, displaying rows of teeth dripping with white foam, but to Burke's shock, the creature did not bite. Instead, it grabbed him, slammed him painfully against the heavy metal door, knocking air from him and cracking the back of his skull. Hmm. 
everything went black. Air rushed past his face, under his arms. I'm flying. I'm Superman. He was a child again, flying through his house in his imagination. His parents' multi-million dollar flat had glowing white walls set on a dim nightlight mode, with vast archways overhead, like a heavenly cathedral. No, he realized. I'm being carried. He felt strong hands gripping his ribs, holding him. An odd thought struck him. Think before you scream. Flying through the house was a vivid memory, one of his earliest. His mother had carried him to the bathroom. She'd pulled him from bed, still wet from urine. His mother dropped him roughly to the bathtub and turned on the water before he could begin to undress. Burke must have been about four. He peered up into her beautiful face. Even as a young woman, his mother had a sculpted look. His father was a plastic surgeon, after all, and like the other surgeons at his country club, he'd made his wife stunning, inhumanly beautiful, a monument to his art. She changed her appearance from time to time, and on this occasion she appeared almost Latina, with a light coffee skin dye, black hair, and fiery black eye dye. Burke's father pushed his head through the bathroom door and warned, Be gentle with him, hun. He stinks, his mother said. God, children stink. In this memory, Burke hardly recognized his mother. He remembered her better with bright blue eyes and golden hair, or as a redhead with wider cheeks. Like many women who had had too many surgeries, her face had lost its plasticity, had become curiously unanimated, more as if she'd been carved from marble than flesh. Her accusation of him stinking stung him. Burke was a bedwetter. No matter how much he bathed, his mother claimed he stank. As a smaller boy, he would longed to hold her, had dreamt of cradling his head between her firm breasts, but he'd never been able to. She was a goddess, cool and untouchable. Mm. Burke trembled, felt pain in his sides, and realized that someone was still carrying him. Think before you scream. He roused his sluggish eyes open enough to see. He was racing through a dim hall. The alien held him under the armpits, lurching and jostling at incredible speed as it raced down a long corridor. He struggled to breathe, took a mental inventory. He was in the grip of a xenomorph, taller than him and stronger than him. He knew where it was taking him. It carried him as his mother had, and with embarrassment, he felt a familiar warmth between his legs. He hadn't wet himself since he was a child, and the thought flashed, the alien thinks I stink. He had no weapons. He'd been forced to flee Ripley and her marines without one, but his father had taught him, your mind is your most powerful weapon. But his thoughts were muzzy right now and seemed to move at the speed of honey. Burke wondered if the creatures could understand human speech and spoke cautiously. Wait a minute, he offered. Let's talk about this. His heart pounded and he waited for an interminable instant to see if the xenomorph would respond. Can you understand me? Are you open to negotiation? The xenomorph stopped running, threw him in the air a little, and turned Burke to face him. It understands me, he considered hopefully. Or is it like a dog that just responds to tone? Without skipping a beat, the creature hissed and smashed him against a plasteel bulkhead, as if he were a baseball bat, and everything went dark. Burke woke to unbearable pain and sirens in a fetid room. 
He struggled to regain consciousness and found he could not move his arms or legs. He remembered where he was, what kind of creatures held him. Mm -hmm. Think before you scream. He let himself go limp, playing dead. He could taste blood in his mouth and his right cheek felt swollen. He'd been dreaming, terribly lucid dreams, like hallucinations caused by opium, where everything looked distorted but felt so real, as if the subconscious was struggling to communicate through vivid images. He tried to recall a fleeting image of a girl he'd seduced in college. In his dream, she'd said something like, you're responsible for everything you put in your mouth. The message seemed terribly important. What was her name? Ah, oh, well, it didn't really matter. He'd seduced lots of girls. He was good looking, after all, and rich, and girls would fall for any lie he told them. He opened his good eye and peered about in the dim light, bleary. He struggled to focus. Brownish gray material covered the walls, looking for all the world like the interior of an animal's rib cage. He'd once killed a neighbor's dog as a child, and knew those shapes. Other shapes seemed just as organic, but impossible to define. He recognized this place. The atmospheric processing plant, down in its lowest levels. The alien hive. His heart lurched, and he strained to move, but his torso, legs, and arms felt stuck in some resinous substance. Everything smelled hot, and the resin had an unidentifiable odor, similar to human vomit mixed with decay and sex. Around him, he saw the shadowy shapes of other people, men, women, children. They stood encased in resin, frozen, their faces twisted in horror, arms and fingers outstretched. He didn't recognize the closest man. He must have been a settler. There was a gaping hole in the man's chest where an alien's spawn had burst out. That's where the rot is coming from. Human carcasses were everywhere, plastered one on top of another. Resin covered him too, only his face was free. He could breathe the fetid air, but could not move. He experimented tried swiveling his hips. The resin was thick around his legs like cement boots, but the resin felt more viscous next to his body. The outside material had hardened, like glue exposed to the air. He tried shaking his head, managed to force the resin back a bit, but could not break free. He experimented with his hands. The casing around his right hand was hard as stone, but on the left, it must have been fresher. It still felt viscous near his fingers. He fought and twisted till he managed to break the thin outer crust near his left hand. He imagined that if he worked fast enough, he might free an entire arm, then break open the rest of the crust inch by inch. He heard a splat and looked up. By the light of a sputtering fire, he spotted movement through a partly obscured archway, saw the head and part of the body of an enormous xenomorph, one that stood at least 15 feet tall. It had a vast abdomen attached to it, tall as a house, longer than a bus, and she had just deposited an enormous white egg onto a pile of crap-like goo. Her abdomen rippled as muscles in it moved, like a piece of worm's gut, and then she lurched forward slightly. Burke recognized that body part, dredged a word from an old biology class. It was an ovipositor, like the ones on a carnivorous wasp or a queen termite. A smaller xenomorph came into view, picked up the egg on its little goo pile and peered toward him. Wait, no, Burke shouted and tried to wiggle his hand. The huge alien mother made a soft growl, peered toward him. The smaller xenomorph set the egg aside, and Burke felt some relief. 
but the xenomorph drone hurried over to another egg, picked it up, and set it at Burke's feet. Burke felt scared witless. No plans would come. He tried to wriggle aside to break his casing. He fought to free his hand, but the xenomorph hissed and lashed its bony tail, then thrust its teeth in his face. Calm down, Burke said. I get it. You don't want me to move. Yet he couldn't just sit there. The xenomorph backed away, watching him. Above its shoulders, dead men peered down, and Burke suddenly remembered a huge nativity scene that his mother had put up one Christmas. It had Mary and Joseph peering down at a baby Jesus in a cradle, while the wise men stared on and angels flew above. His mind twisted in dreamlike ways. Suddenly, Burke was Joseph, and the baby Jesus was an egg with one of those creatures, a face hugger inside. The hovering angels were horrid corpses, and once the egg hatched, the vaguely crab-like creature would climb to his face, insert a tube down his throat, implant some kind of embryo. Look, he begged the xenomorph. The worker peered at him like an ignorant dog, but the queen in the other room turned her head, studying him. Her face was rigid chiseled and sculpted, and he saw his mother's calculating, unfeeling gaze behind those eyes. Hmm. What do you want? He begged her. The room was hot. Fires were already blazing. This whole place was going to go up in a mushroom cloud, he knew. I work for Wayland yutani Corporation. I can get you anything. What do you want? A new world? He realized that he had to get creative try to think on their level. You want cows to eat? People? I can get them for you. The Queen Mother peered at him as if trying to decipher what he said, then turned away as she pooped another egg. <laughs> Burke felt sweaty all over, had huge rivulets running down his face. He felt sick to his stomach and choked on vomit. The egg in front of him began to quiver and shake, and a crack appeared. His heart hammered wildly, and his mouth felt drier than he'd ever imagined, drier than the toxic sands of the Gobi. He struggled to break free, rocking wildly, and the xenomorph drone hissed a warning. He rocked and screamed until he could not move, and suddenly became aware that sometime in the past minute, he'd fallen back to sleep. His skull felt mushy in back. Concussion, he thought, as he fought to regain consciousness. He was locked in amber, peering down at the egg once again. Everything was off. The face hugger had been coming for him, but now it seemed to still be in the egg. He realized that he had been dreaming, yet the drone xenomorph was still watching him. Screw you, he shouted as a facehugger oozed from its shell, a beige nightmare. The xenomorph drone hissed encouragement to the facehugger, then peered up in satisfaction, like a midwife caught in the throes of admiring the miracle of birth. Screw all of you, Burke shouted. That ain't no baby Jesus, and I ain't no... Loser. He raged and struggled for one more moment. Think before you scream. There's still a way to turn this around, he realized. He'd hoped to smuggle one of these facehuggers off-planet inside Ripley and Newt. An insane thought took him. So crazy that he realized it was genius. This creature could be a gold mine. If I carry it inside me, and if I can get on the ship, put myself in stasis and leave instructions for those who find me, it will still work, he realized. All he lacked was time. The whole processing plant was going to blow soon. He'd need to break free after the attack, get out before the creature ate him from inside. All too soon, the facehugger leapt at him. It seemed to float in a dreamlike motion, its legs waving at him and then grasping his head. 
It covered his face with its soft, crab-like body and tried to insert something down his throat. Burke struggled to keep his teeth clenched, to twist his face aside, but realized that every second he fought was another second wasted. Swallow it down, he told himself. Just take it. He had to do it, even though he was screaming inside. He opened his mouth wide and let the face hugger do its work. Oh God, what have I done? But it was his only chance. He didn't have a gun, nothing to even the odds. He didn't have the strength to break free. He couldn't breathe. He fought the creature for a breath, but couldn't get air. His face and muscles all strained and began to burn as if he were drowning. Just take it, he told himself. And as he faded from consciousness, he remembered. As a teen, he'd walked in on his mother once, the famous realtor, as she entertained a client. What the man did to her looked more like rape than lovemaking. Burke had kept the incident secret for three days, worried what would happen. Would his father be furious? Had his mother seduced the man or been raped? Would she leave his father? Part of him hoped that she'd leave. She'd run the house with an iron hand, a cruel mistress. Part of him just wanted to be free of the secret. And so, at a Sunday dinner, he told his father what he'd seen, hoping that Mom would confess, that maybe she'd be freed by it, that maybe things would work out better. Heavy silence followed. Burke's father, a stern man who seemed never to grow old, simply spread his hands above his plate, winked at his wife, and said, We all do what we must in this family. What do you mean? Burke asked, lips trembling. Your mother brings in a lot of money, his father said. I'm a famous surgeon, but I only supply 18% of our income. Your mother gets the rest. Hmm. His mother was in her redhead phase, with wide-set cheekbones and skin bleached ivory. Don't you understand, son, she said. I wear different faces for my clients. I find out what they like, then target them. They wouldn't pay a normal realtor much, but a beautiful woman... One who could sue them into oblivion? Who could expose them for what they are? Lead them to arrest or divorce? They pay me very well. While Burke's jaw dropped, his father smiled. I saw the rape. It was recorded. I've seen all of them. Why do you think I put these different faces on for your mother? It's for her marks. Burke's mother studied him with her sculpted gaze and said, I do what I must for money. And if you are any son of mine, you will do your part, too. Burke had always done what he felt he needed to in order to get ahead. He woke to blaring sirens with a throat that felt hot and raw. The room had grown blistering. Fires were raging. Sweat poured from him. Too much sweat. It was in his clothes, encasing him beneath the cocoon. He felt wrung out at the end of his strength. He looked about for the face hugger, realized that it wasn't around. A dream, he realized. Must have been a bad dream. Through the narrow corridors, he could no longer see the xenomorph worker nor the queen. The egg was still in front of him, waiting to hatch. Sirens blared. A female computerized voice warned, Attention! Emergency! All personnel must evacuate immediately. You now have 15 minutes to reach minimum safe distance. Shit. Burke wondered, how long was I out for? 
15 minutes, did he have time to escape? Even if he ran as fast as he could, he wouldn't make it outside the blast zone. He needed a vehicle. Even a wheeled excursion vehicle might do. A ship would be best. He thrust his left arm against the resin, banging it with the heel of his palm. The outer crust cracked reluctantly, and he managed to reach around. By punching the crust above his right hand, he damaged the resin, but he felt weak. The material around his legs and torso had hardened while he slept, locking his body into place. Worst of all, he had a stomachache. While he wondered at it, his thoughts grew muzzy. He realized that it was not the normal pain of bloating or heartburn, but something he'd never imagined. He felt a creature inside him, down in his guts, like a huge octopus in a bowl swimming about. Terror lanced through him, cold and shocking, so that he felt nearly mindless with fear. He knew what was coming. Somehow he'd been impregnated by a facehugger, but when? He flailed against the resin until his left fist became bloody, pulpy and raw. He still could not break through. He pummeled until his head dropped in fatigue. A rest. He tried to catch his breath. He woke again. Sirens continued to blare, and the computer warned that Burke had 13 minutes to reach safety. In the distance, xenomorphs shrieked in pain and rage. The hissing of a flamethrower sounded nearby. Someone was fighting. The Marines? For an instant, Burke imagined himself being a hero. With a sudden burst of energy, he broke from his resinous casing, staggered into a hallway and saw the queen alien rushing toward him. He stared into dark eyes that seemed not to reflect the firelight so much as drink it in. His mother's eyes. His mother's chiseled, emotionless face with skin thinly stretched over a skull. The alien morphed into his mother. She said in an echoing voice, You're free. He realized that he could make it to the ship. He had to. So he began to jog, his path lit by a trail of flares that burned among the twists and turns of the hive. Something wrenched inside him, and he felt terribly hungry. The chest burster was draining his energy, depleting it. Burke ran for a bit, reached an elevator. He hit the call button, but no elevator dropped. Instead, the sirens blared. Seven minutes to reach minimum safe distance. He struggled to... Okay, I just wanted to tell you, like, so, so she's, the queen got off from her overpositor, and you remember Burke was, like, trying to hit, um, this resin wasn't doing nothing. I think what she did, I think she freed him. I think the queen freed him, because he said she ran towards him. It doesn't say if she freed him or not, he just ran towards him and said, you were free. And then that's when she, the... The, uh, the queen is going into the elevator to face Ripley. I always thought that um, Ripley gave him a grenade. That's what I thought. I remember she did that. But I guess in this story is different. To catch his breath and realized at last that the lift wasn't coming. Fire vented up from a nearby crevice and lightning arced between two pillars. Some metal beams fell nearby and the station shuddered. The plant was coming apart. Burke hurried to the emergency stairs and began to climb. The building shook and more flames shot up beside the open staircase. He reached the top of the landing platform as the mechanized voice called, Two minutes to reach minimum safe distance. Burke gazed up to see the blunt shape of the space shuttle lifting off into clouds, the fires of its engines gleaming bright in the half-light. Flames shot up around the platform, impossibly hot, and lightning arced into the sky in a bright crown. 
The whole platform trembled, as if it would teeter and fall into the fiery pit. Burke reached to his aching head, mussed his hair, and peered about in frustration. Something moved inside him, pushing out his ribs, like a baby on steroids, kicking. Fires vented from a dozen shafts nearby, billowing soot and smoke. The last of his hopes flew away with the shuttle. One minute to reach minimum safe distance, the computer announced, and something within him lurched. Burke shook his head, wondering, is there life after death? Do I get another chance? Or am I just going straight to hell? He wondered how many billions of people had asked that question in their final moment. He dropped to his knees, too weary to flee anymore, and gave birth. The alien ripped from his chest. Blood and fluids gushed out with it, his guts and stomach spilling onto the metal floor like afterbirth. Miraculously, the creature seemed to have missed ripping out his heart and lungs. It just left a gaping hole and lay there, its skin looking almost red in the firelight. It made a tiny growl and peered around. Burke slumped to his side felt his heart weakening, the blood and life pouring out. His breathing slowed until he had no more energy. He blinked and found himself waking to see a facehugger still crawling toward him. The ground shook and he realized, this place is going to blow. Sometimes we can wake from dark dreams into a deeper darkness. What? Let, let me The blood it. and life pouring out. What, what happened here? Okay, let me... Alright, let's, let's do this again. His breathing slowed until he had no more energy. Okay. He blinked and found himself waking to see a face hugger still crawling toward him. A face hugger was crawling toward... Okay, so I'm, I'm just guessing that because his heart is beating right so his heart is still beating his vitals are still alive and so the face hugger is like echo location it's like okay this this is a guy i can i can still do something okay so i think it's just a face hugger acting dumb or something this uh desperate a desperate face hugger the ground shook and he realized this place is going to blow. Sometimes we can wake from dark dreams into a deeper darkness. Okay, so this is the analyzation of um, Dark Mother. Before I do say, you know, uh, go deep into this or go as deep as I can into it. Um, I think this is actually, uh, the other day we listened to Deep Black, and I actually think maybe this one is better than Deep Black. Like, bo both of these, I kind of like struggle to find which one is better. So between Deep Black and Dark Mother, one of these are the better ones. Some people might say that um, Sigler's uh, Dangerous Prey. So some say that Dangerous Pre Prey is probably the best one because Scott Sigler is like a really, really good storyteller, especially when it comes to the Alien universe. He, he wrote um, Alien Phallix, and I think that's arguably probably the best Alien novel of them, all besides Cold Forge. So, so for me, it's Cold Forge, but for some people, it might be Alien Phallix, especially if you got the audio book and you got Balky reading it from perfect strangers okay so um anyway uh that being said it's a really good book okay and so we're gonna look at basically um the the goofs okay so i want i want the goofs basically the the stuff that make you kind of confused and this this is why i stopped it a little bit and i was like what okay 
So they have some goofs here from this story alone. Okay, so so it says original printings of the book include numerous errors in this story, including the editor's notes seemingly left within the text. And he said, oh, including editor's notes seemingly left within the text and a jump from Burke being cocooned to him being free without his escape ever being explained. So yeah, so that's why I stopped because it was just like, okay. So he was cocooned and he was like, he was cocooned, right? And he was trying to struggle to get out and then he couldn't get out. And then um, that part where Ripley with the fire extinguisher and then the alien mother is running towards him and it's like a caricature of his mother, right? Because Dark Mother is like this, he's, he's probably afraid of his mother more than he's afraid of the queen, right? And so he sees his mother running towards him and I'm like, okay, he gets free somehow? But then I think, okay, so he gets free and then he tells a story of him being free when he tells his father about his mother's exploit. Him thinking that he's free. But he's actually not free because they're in on it. So that was kind of, I mean, I like the juxtaposition, but it was kind of confusing. All right, so at that, so it says cocoon without ever being explained. He also mysteriously acquires a grenade without explanation. Hinting at the deleted scene cut from aliens where Ripley hands him one. I didn't get that part. So so he did, did he have a grenade? Because I remember the deleted scene when that's why I was saying like Ripley gave him a grenade. I remember that. And she's walking through and then when she, before she even gets to the elevator, he lets off the explosion, right? So he shouldn't even be alive um, on, 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 you know, on the level where the ship took off. He shouldn't even be alive because according to the story, if we're going by canon, if we're going by canon, he, he should not even be alive. That should have been it. Like when she gave him the grenade and then 30 seconds afterward, like he blows it up because you saw the movie. That's the deleted scene. Okay. Uh... At one point, Ripley is misspelled, okay, Ridley, thereby creating a metafictional, albeit presumably unintentional, link to Ridley Scott, the director of Alien. Hmm, interesting. The gestation of the xenomorph chestburster is incredibly quick in the story, likely ranging from only one to two hours. Okay, but that's possible because it's possible. It's possible. Okay, some of them they they don't just stay quickly. It take days. Some take several hours. I've read about that. Um, this reason was why the original deleted scene featuring a cocoon Burke from the film was ultimately cut. Oh, because of the time. Right? It, it wouldn't make sense. Yeah? Uh, remember that... I remember in Aliens 1, there was a similar kind of deal where Ripley also did... I think there's a deleted scene in Alien 1. I'm pretty sure there's a deleted scene in Alien... in this original Alien where... Um, gosh, I can't even... I can't even remember the, the pilot's name. The captain, right? He was being he was being egg morphed. And if you don't know what egg morphed is, that's when you have a lone xenomorph and he's just the xenomorph's by himself and they gotta create a queen. Right? And how they create a queen is you know, they steal one of the people, they steal one a host, and then 
in some way it can be like egg morphed or whatever. Just like with a bee, like if one bee dies, they have some way where they have some special royal jelly to make another queen, okay? Because in a beehive, when the queen comes, she kills every other queen because there can be multiple queens and but the ones that is birthed first she's going to try to kill the rest of the queens or the rest of the potential queens she will do that and then she's the only queen okay and actually if you don't know a queen sting a queen bee sting is less painful than a like a um like a worker bee sting which is crazy even though she she doesn't lose a sting it's less lethal it's less like it hurts less than a regular worker's bee sting so when we see a queen bee sometimes we're afraid it's only the size you know that makes us afraid but the sting i mean the sting is 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 not supposedly is not as bad as a worker's bee sting i got stung by a bee once not that bad it's just all bark and then like a little bite, you know. Um, but I loved this story. I loved it because I wanted to know what happened to Carter Burke. Like, uh, there's so much juxtaposition, like with Jesus Christ. Like you could say, you know, Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for something, like sacrificed himself for, for humanity, right? I know Carter Burke is not sacrificing himself for humanity, uh, if you look at it in a human sense. But in alien sense, uh, all these things that they taken back to the hive is, is, is a sacrifice to the aliens. So you gotta look at them, right? They only doing what comes natural to them. Right, I gotta propagate. That's, who, that's what I gotta do. There's nothing I can do. I just. That's just the way I program. I have to pro propagate. It's hateful. I gotta kill or propagate. And so you can see these hosts as like, it could be even a mockery of Jesus, right? That this is death. Okay, when, when, when I'm saying this, I'm looking at like when the, the concept that H.R. Geiger. So when he made these, back in the day when he made this, right? It's called a Necronomicon, like the Necronomicon, the book of, of ne the book of the dead or something, right? And what could he be saying to us is that, yo, you die, that's it. There's no... <laughs> sacrifice the, the 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 xenomorph is the demon right that's mocking Christ because it's mocking our religion it's mocking humanity there's nothing there's no life after death and so when when they are being cocooned into the wall it's like Jesus Christ being nailed to the cross, you can't get out. And they throwing stones at him and stuff like that. And the last sup of Jesus, he's like, yo, this is my body. Like, eat my body, right? This is my blood. Drink my blood, eat my body. And Gaychar Geiger is saying, Look at your creation, like, this is your Jesus, you're all Jesus. That means you're nothing, you're no one. Eat your own body, right? Um, what I'm going to do is open your mouth. Here, eat this, right? It could be like, eat a dick, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm gonna impregnate you, I'm gonna rape you, you know? Um, this is the Antichrist. You know, that's what the xenomorph is. So, you know, that's why I didn't like Inter Cerebrus, because I knew, I know what the xenomorph is. It's the devil, it's, it's the antichrist. Um, 
Scott Sigler, he said it in a phallus. If you if you listen to the phallus, um, those people that they were looking at these things as antichrist, as devil incarnate, as evil incarnate, you know, and that's what the xenomorph is. It cannot be reasoned with. It cannot be bargained with. It will not stop until you are dead. You know, after Terminator, okay, we're looking at the xenomorph. It will not stop until you are dead. The Terminator stops. You can program him to do some other stuff. You cannot program a xenomorph to behave. That's it. It will not stop until you are dead, right? And it mocks your religion. It mocks your God. Bring any God you want, it mocks it. In fact, the xenomorph killed its God. If you look at Prometheus, all those things died because the thing that they created, the monster, the xenomorph, the antichrist, the devil incarnate, killed their creator. And so that's what I see, you know, when I see them against the walls, like, he's mocking Jesus Christ, like, the, the, the Nepo, you know, um, H.R. Geiger is like, this is a mock of Jesus. It's a mock. What? You want further proof? The the alien dies. Or the, it, it kind of recreates itself. It is risen, right? The, it, they put something inside the body. It takes about three days for it to rise again. And then it becomes very stronger, right? Jesus, three days. He dies. They bury him. Three days later, he comes out. Right? Um, three days later, he descends to heaven. He descends to God. Right? Three days later, the, the xenomorph goes to the queen. We still, there's still so much stuff we don't know. How do you create a pre, pre uh, um, Oh, you you know you got the two protectors. It's called a prey, a prey authoring guard or something like this. And how do you create those? Like the other species that they've overtaken, you know. So I mean, this is why Alien has lasted so long because the life cycle is just so insane. Like there will never be another life cycle that is crazier than the xenomorph like it is so insane it is so nightmarish that uh, you can make thousands of stories about this so this is why i like dark mother what do you think um please like and subscribe and this is mostly sci-fi well mostly